I'm joined today by Sultan bin Salai, Chairman and CEO of DP World. Thanks so much for joining me today. All right, let's start with an overview of where we are coming out of COVID-19. I did read about profits dropping 29%. Where are we right now? Actually, that's a misinterpretation. Uh, our profit dropped maybe uh, less than 5%. What happened is the year before 2019, we, we sold a land we owned, which is not a normal income. So that's one off. Income increase because of not our operation, because we have a land where we don't want to develop it, and we sold it. So we uh, received that amount. That could not be repeated. But if you look like to like, we are a little bit the same, almost the same. Another issue uh, in global headlines is, of course, the blockage of the Suez Canal. How did this impact uh, DP World specifically, and what can we learn as an international community to prevent things like that happening in the future? I mean, these are the things sometimes that happen and nobody can even expect it to happen, and nobody expects it to be uh, happening this way. Uh, it affected the world, of course, you know, at, at that time, the loss of uh, revenue, the loss to the world economy was like $400 million an hour. And people say, wow, that's like $9 billion almost every day, yes. I mean, imagine, just to give you an example, imagine someone is, selling, is buying coffee from Ethiopia. It's coming in the Red Sea. And coffee is a commodity. The price changes. The buyer could have been sold, selling it to somebody else. But all the sales are on one condition, delivering this coffee at a certain location, and you block it. Who's going to pay him the losses? Because he couldn't make the sale. He's delayed. So there are just coffee is an example, and you can see many examples like that. So what are the long-term effects of this incident? Uh, I, I think we, we, learned, we learned that uh, they have to have a way to make sure this doesn't happen. When you, when the, the good thing about mistakes is you learn from them. Are we overly dependent on the Suez Canal? The Suez Canal is handling almost 14% of all trade. So it's a very vital area. I mean, the alternative is to go around the uh, Cape of Good Hope, but that's a long way. So uh, I think the solution is the Egyptian they must have another uh, interest to the canal from the Red Sea. They did it from the Mediterranean, and they should have, I think, a redundancy. They should have another canal, very easy because it's all flat. So the solution future is I think they have to invest in another channel to avoid the blockage because uh, Suez Canal is very vital for trade. Can you think of a, of a similar incident that impacted global trade to this extent? I know, not, not, with, not with this severity of this, because everybody took it by for granted that Suez Canal is open. Everybody who is importing something is delayed by a few weeks. And the delay is not going to be going away, it's going to continue. We are now uh, dedicating our ports, whether it's in Jeddah or Sukhna in Egypt or Dubai, to deal with uh, giving relief to the people who are stuck with their cargo. So it's still, this is still an ongoing process. It's an Although ongoing process. shipping has returned to normal, Absolutely. you're still dealing with yeah, some Yeah, because of whoever couldn't get in is still waiting. Or who is going to get, have to get these people out. We also saw in recent months attacks on Gulf shipping. How much is this a concern to you? Anytime somebody attacks uh, a shipping and trade route is, is, is definitely concerning. And we hope that the uh, international community is going to take measures to stop anyone interfering and endangering important vital trade routes, whether it is uh, piracy, like in, the, uh, in West Africa or in the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Babel Mandeb, or without attacks uh, on the Gulf uh, and interest of the Gulf. This is something that I think it need not UAE, but need a world united stand against it. So this is very important. militarily, politically? They have to use whatever they need to make sure that the trade flows uh, normally, because it will cost the world a lot to have disruption. Premium insurance will shoot up, uh, disruption in cargo. I can tell you, nobody can close the sale from us. It is, uh, people can say that, it's impossible. But the disturbance, shoot a tanker, the premium will increase. 
So they have to have a solution, a lasting solution, I think, to deal with this issue and the causes, and hopefully it will be away. You know, it's clear that technology, investing in technology is high on your agenda. It's high on the UAE agenda. Of course, one of the examples is Hyperloop. Can you share a little bit about this project, where it is now, and if you're investing in any other technologies that well, you this, the Hyperloop is, is a disruptive technology. Uh, we saw it as disruptive technology because basically they're going to move cargo, of course passenger, but cargo from city to city. And the concerning for, thing for me is that if somebody invented technology like that to move cargo between a city and a city, what would happen to our ports? We invested billions in our ports. So that's when we started to get closer to the technology. Eventually we invested in it. And uh, the milestone was achieved last year in November when we were able to put a human in the loop. Now once that's done, I think everything else will fall in the right place. So we, we believe this technology is going to be very, very important for transportation. In 2016, yes. you said that ports might not be as significant in the future with these new technologies. What do you think today? Well, let me tell you, we, 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 since we said that, we started to say we have to define our role. Are we port operators? And what do we operate? We operate the port. What do we do in the port? We handle cargo. So we said, since our core is cargo, we're not going to depend on the cargo only in the port. We need to handle cargo outside the port, in addition to the port. So actually today, in 2014, 80% of our revenue comes from cargo handling inside the port. Today, only 45% of our revenue comes from the handling cargo inside the port. That is what we did when we said that we cannot depend on the cargo handling in the port. We have to be part of the supply chain and own some parts of the supply chain. So today, we can do end-to-end -end solution from one the, 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 the factory floor until the customer or consumer door. That's our role, and that's what we are doing today. So looking at the future of DP World, uh, will you invest in more ports around the world? What are you eyeing in terms of expansion? We are a customer-oriented company, and we follow the cargo. And wherever our customer go, we will be. If someone wants to move cargo in the North Pole and there's cargo, we'll be there. But we'll only go if there's cargo. We'll not go. We don't look at how big we want to be. We don't look at how many ports we need to handle. We look at how much cargo we can handle. And where we can handle it, we can handle it efficiently for our customer and profitably for us. And these are two criteria for our expansion. We don't do anything for a strategic reason or to become the biggest or uh, the first. We look at how we sustain our revenue, how we sustain our service to our customers. And I just need to hear about the Abraham Accords. I know you've been a very active voice. How are we going to see the region now with more opportunities? Well, uh, in our business, logistically, because I, I will speak only of what I know, and I know about logistics. Uh, we never really consider Israel as part of the logistics in our business. We are basically handling cargo in our European ports and handling in the Far East. And now, that's available, it's a very good logistical bridge for our ports in Europe to transit and maybe have some uh, handling and added value and then goes out because it can give me a direct route faster. Okay? Then of course many technologies which we are not able to use today are available and we at our reach. And then it also from the Israeli side. So from us, our side is technology, which, which we want to get out of this Abraham Court. We want to get uh, trade opportunities, business, science, medical. From the Israeli side, the uh, spread of DP world around the world in over 90 terminals, over 60 countries. From the main hub of Jabal Ali, you can handle you can reach up to three billion people. A three hour flight from Dubai, you have three international airports. You have Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and Sharjah. Three big airports can get you within three hours to over two billion people. And that's an opportunity which the Israeli people cannot get 
at that time. Now they can get and they can from here start to reach Africa, to reach the Indian market, to reach uh, the Indian subcontinent, to reach CIS countries from a big hub here where we have invested in UAE logistically the best facilities. So, Tendon Salaam, thanks so much Thank for you. your time today. Thank you.